I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I'm not sure what you were experiencing there, but for me that meditation was particularly tranquilizing and um, enjoyable. Uh, I don't tend to do structured tranquility-oriented meditations like that very often. I mean, I don't tend to, I'm, as a teacher, I'm going to do more of that. Just Hopefully that was good. Uh, tranquility. So to kind of set the stage here, and I can feel already my mind is pretty tranquil. So just shifting into active, conceptual, sequential stuff is a little like, whoa. So it's not that I'm on quaaludes, really. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of cool. So, huh. In, in our practice, we're aware of really these two currents, these two tracks. And they're summarized in this traditional metaphor of the wagon of awakening, which has two wheels following two tracks. And so in our lives, we're, we're aware of what is already okay, already peaceful, already all right, already enough, already connected, already home. Right? We're aware of that aspect, maybe <clears throat> only metaphorically like, you know, a kind of a shaft of sunlight piercing through dark clouds, but we have a sense of it. And then there is the process of development, of gradual change for the better, which includes the change of healing, working our way out of traumatic material, working our way out of neurotic patterns, habits of various kinds, you know, healing, repairing, mending, and then moving increasingly into growing, uh, cultivating wholesome qualities, happy qualities of mind and heart. And over time, including in that, in the Buddhist path, cultivating various factors of wisdom, uh, inner peace, contentment, love, and joy. We cultivate. And so the Buddha identified um, seven factors of awakening. I don't think it's the complete list. I don't think there are only seven factors, but it's a good list. And seven, you can remember seven things, um, although I sometimes forget one or two. And we've been working our way through mindfulness, investigation, energy, or we could say effort, uh, bliss, sometimes translated as rapture or joy, and then tonight, tranquility, followed next by concentration or samadhi in particular non-ordinary states of deep uh, transformational experiences. And then seven, equanimity, being undisturbed by all that is disturbing. So previously, we've explored the first four of those. And here I'd like to explore with you tranquility, which is such an interesting factor. Because when you think of a factor, it's something that moves things along, right? The, the bat is a factor, boom, in the progression of the baseball. A factor, but tranquility seems almost antithetical. Like what, tranquility is causal? Like what, it's just tranquil, it's stillness. How, how could it affect anything? Energy, yeah, bliss, you can see that. 
you know, having a mind of equanimity, you can get that, but tranquility, huh? And yeah, tranquility is really potent. So um, in both the Buddhist tradition and you could say in ordinary psychology, tranquility is an antidote to the stressful, suffering, saturated, common daily round of rushing about from pillar to post. Uh, we have a mind that's buzzing, buzzing, buzzing. Um, we're bombarded with stimuli. Rawr, rawr, rawr. The world is demanding us one thing or another, jostling us here and there. You just see pictures of modern life, of people walking quickly in city streets. Um, you know, your mind can feel like one of those uh, intersections that you see in Tokyo where people are rushing about and just, whoosh, that's our minds these days. And in all that is a lot of suffering. Uh, in all that are both the results of craving and the causes of craving. Because when we're agitated in that way, it's really hard to feel like you're okay already. It's really hard to feel that you've got enough already. And that sense of um, not all rightness and not enoughness is a biological engine of craving leading to suffering and harm. An untranquil mind is fertile ground for the metaphorical weeds that create conflicts with others, lots of self-criticism because we don't feel settled, we don't feel at ease. Um, you know, an untranquil mind is, is troubled. So there's a place for appreciating the value of a growing tranquility. Now, importantly, this does not mean ignoring what's problematic. And understandably, there are times when we really are jostled. There you are walking along, burp, someone jostled you, uh, or you get the news that jostles you, or, or you just watch the news <laughs> jostling. Uh, things happen, you know? Um, maybe your body is uh, is untranquil because you know you've got issues with your gastrointestinal system. Um, there's a lot of research about the interaction between uh, disturbed digestive processes and disturbed mental emotional processes, uh, the gut brain connection, and all the rest of that. The microbiome, just for example, not going to get deep in those weeds. My point is, things maybe you're dealing with chronic pain. They're things that naturally jostle us. So there's nothing here uh, in anything I'm saying, and certainly not in the Buddha Dharma, that's about numbing, no, or flattening, or suppressing. Um, I um, had a client uh, a while back, a therapy client, who was had grappled with depression their whole life, and they began, and was also a very creative artist, and began taking antidepressants. And this person said to me, yeah, the antidepressants, um, they prevent the lows, but they also blunt the highs. And I, I can't make art anymore. And I'd rather be depressed and capable of making art than flat, not depressed, but incapable of generating any kind of creativity. So there's nothing here that's about flattening, blunting, suppressing, repressing, etc. So tranquility has a lot of value. You could feel it, right? You could feel it in the meditation. I'm still feeling it right now. And um, tranquility, among other benefits, can bring us home to an undisturbed resting state. And tranquility gives us perspective on the noise of our habitual preoccupations and ruminations and the noise of other people. You know, the more tranquil you are, the, the more uh, the stiller you are, the more you see that movement, the agitation, the activity, the velocity. Uh, 
um, of the of the world around you. Um, sometimes even in family systems or relationships, uh, a person who can, as the theologian put it, Thurgood Mar Howard Thurgood Thurgood Marshall, no Howard Thurgood. Please help me. You'll put it in the chat. Howard Thurman? No. Anyway, he said, looking out at the world with quiet eyes. You start looking at the world with quiet eyes and you feel um, undisturbed in the marrow of your being, even as you're dealing with the crud of life still. Sometimes other people feel like you're not getting it because you're not super upset like they are. And it's really important to appreciate that we can have an underlying stillness, an underlying Repose is another word that's often used. Um, an underlying peacefulness while seeing clearly and fiercely, fiercely working to make a better world. The two together, right? Fierce tranquility. Tranquility, inner tranquility, outer intensity. I mean, there's a combination there. So tranquility helps us see the unnecessary, uh, truly unnecessary, uh, excessive uh, uh, clamor of the world, over alarmism. Uh, as an example of that, um, you may recall that uh, you know in the year or so after the attacks on America of 9/11, uh, acknowledging the many layers of causes of those events, uh, routinely you'd walk through an airport and there would be literally flashing signs the size of a billboard with periodic announcements every 90 seconds or so over the PA system. You know, the director of Homeland Security, blah, 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 has declared condition threat level orange. And days would go by, months and even years would go by in which it was always threat level orange. And actually, the likelihood of a bad event on anybody's flight that day, and certainly on the, my flight that day, the odds of a bad event were th threat level, very, very green chartreuse, like a swimming pool of green paint, you know, with a drop of yellow in it. That was the actual statistical chance of some kind of a terrorist attack on my airplane on, on that day. And I just found it was actually a really useful personal practice to deliberately be mindful of the kind of bracing and guarding and tension and agitation that would come over me when I would see that sign, threat level orange, right? Or hear the announcement and instead deliberately walk in a more tranquil way, just resist the hijacking of the untranquil manipulations or persuasions or seductions of the world around us. Right? So much value there, right? So much value there. What tranquility also teaches us, and pretty soon I'll get to some things we can do in the real world. <laughs> some of them physiologically informed. What tranquility also teaches us is it brings our awareness to what does not normally capture attention. Attention neurologically, understandably, evolved in the crucible of the wild with mortal risks for all creatures every day. Uh, uh, attention is grabbed by movement and by novelty, the opposite of tranquility. And attention habituates to and gradually starts to ignore or tune out, take for granted that which doesn't change. In tranquility, there is little that is changing. Um, or one can rest in an un a tranquility that has the nature of unchangingness, uh, at least at the time. 
while being aware of that which is changing. Okay. But what tranquility and a focus on tranquility teaches us is it helps us become increasingly free in terms of the routine hijacking of attention toward what is moving, what is different, what is new. And instead of being hijacked in that way, we start to become increasingly aware of what we had previously been habituated to, which is that which is not changing. For example, um, the unchanging volume of the room that you're in, in which many things change. Or we could say the stable, spaciousness of awareness through which many changing phenomena pass. You start to become aware in tranquility of the space between the thoughts. You start to become aware of um, you start to become aware of um, uh, even in your ordinary stream of consciousness, a sense of what's between the sparkling, fizzy risings and passings away of all the bubbling phenomena in consciousness. You start to get a sense of, oh, the not yet conditioned, fertile ground of not yet conditioned neural substrates of awareness, which are like fertile noise. They're getting ready to represent a signal, as it were, a reduction of uncertainty in the substrates of consciousness neurologically, but not yet doing so continuously. You get more and more of a sense of, wow, what is not yet um, condensed around a particular thought or sensation, feeling, or desire. If you don't yet have a sense of these things, you will. Tranquility also gives you more and more a sense of um, that which keeps on going and is okay because we habituate to it. You know, the ongoing okayness in most relationships in which, yeah, stuff happens up or down, but there's probably an ongoing uh, kind of equilibrium okayness in the relationship. You look out at reality, you know, there are all kinds of phenomena change, but reality as reality is stable. So tranquility naturally is a guide into that which is um, reliably stable and not so subject to the changingness that is an unreliable basis for any kind of lasting happiness. Inside ourselves, tranquility, you might have a feeling for this inside yourself. Underneath it all, is there a kind of a place of stillness inside? I think there's a place of stillness inside everyone. You know, um, As soon as we talk about it, we've added activity to it. It's more like you just almost catch a glimpse of it over your shoulder, or as it were, you know, doing a backflip in your own mind stream and, oh, catching a glimpse of stillness on as you complete the flip. Uh, a stillness inside us, such a beautiful refuge. So finishing here on this part, <clears throat> as we'll get to equanimity, um, tranquility is an absence of reactions. Equanimity is a is a is a even more fundamental um, non-reactivity to the reactions moving through awareness. Uh, to be profoundly tranquil in both body and mind um, is uh, really cool, but it's it's a transient state of being, generally speaking. We can be increasingly aware of an underlying tranquility, 
that, yeah, we can have an ongoing sense of that, but to be completely tranquil in your body and completely quiet in your mind is not a very functional uh, state of being in dealing with, you know, the activity demands of, of an ordinary household or life. And so tranquility is, is really good. Uh, I remember Joseph Goldstein, you know, a great teacher, just emphasizing tranquility. Uh, you know, and you may know that the uh, apparently the slogan of the town in which the Insight Meditation Society is located, Barry, Massachusetts, uh, including on the police cars, tranquil and alert. And supposedly uh, when, you know, Jack Cornfield and Sharon Salzberg and, and Joseph and others were, you know, touring towns looking for a place to set up a center. They, they saw that sign as the town motto, tranquil and alert. And they thought, okay, this is, this is a good sign. We'll, we'll find something here. Anyway, um, you know, we can have a kind of underlying tranquility, but on the whole, um, tranquility is, a, is kind of a passing, um, particularly if it's deeply embodied state. Equanimity is something we can maintain increasingly continuously as the underlying kind of ground uh, of who we are. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about this before getting into some practicalities and then opening it up for your discussion is um, when we're stressed, understandably, like with chronic pain, chronic pain, people have talked about that in the chat right now, um, that pain, that agitation, understandably, gets very invasive. And so it's really important to find whatever we can by way of respite and relief and some kind of awareness of what is not pain or not upset. Um, understandably, when certain things happen, we experience what the Buddha called the first darts of life, physical or emotional discomfort from subtle to agonizing. And that's real. And when things happen, sometimes the soft furry animal of the body is upset, uh, is invaded, get it, is, is in pain, let's say. And the question then becomes, is, what else is there in consciousness? And can you find something else? in consciousness. I, I think that I've never experienced on the zero to 10 pain scale, uh, when a 10 is so agonizing, it tends to drive people un into unconsciousness or we you wish for that. I've never experienced that kind of pain. Um, so I, I can't speak from that kind of experience. And I can imagine thinking about um, a teaching from Adya Shanti one time about an extraordinary amount of back pain he was experiencing. Sometimes all you can do is just write it out. Um, but sometimes, you, often you can find what is not the pain, what is not the upset, uh, what is underneath it all. And you might have the sense that, yeah, there is this layer in your consciousness that's um, deeply upset, really worried, really invaded, and yet underneath it all is a kind of underlying tranquility. And find other words perhaps, an underlying peacefulness an underlying release, an underlying serenity. And being able to include an awareness of that underlying level um, is really useful uh, alongside all, all that pain. One thing I'd like to uh, kind of clean up a little in what I said which is a prelude, actually I do it like this. So what are some things that help us be tranquil? One, obviously, is to do what we can in our circumstances. You know, it's hard to be tranquil uh, if you're having to rush about working double shifts at the emergency room uh, or whatever, you know, like we do what we can in our external circumstances. It's hard to be tranquil when people are attacking you or people are messing with you and, uh, or you've got a, you know, a roommate is like a, great, <laughs> I don't know, a whirling dervish, <laughs> debris everywhere, noise all the time. It's hard to be tranquil. So whatever we can do, right, 
in our external circumstances, including in particular um, repair in relationships. You know, one of the things that tends to most disturb our emotional tranquility are um, resentments and hurts with other people, uh, quarrels, grievances. And I'm not saying anything here about uh, giving people a pass for uh, transgressions or um, waiving your rights or not being assertive. I'm just saying that at a certain point, we can try to move into a repair process. And it's possible to repair even with others who won't repair with you. That's a lot, it's harder. Uh, but I've written a lot about it in different places, including in my book, Making Great Relationships uh, there. But to have the motivation for repair, which can be scary and vulnerable and awkward and embarrassing and like, uh, you might have to admit your own faults. Ay. Repair can really, really help a person move to a more tranquil mind. And you might just take a moment here to reflect on um, some repairs maybe that you might make. I did a personal growth training way back when, and one of the things we did is we took a look at our so-called perpetrations, our things that we had done that we look at them and kind of wince with memory. And as best we could, we coped to them, including writing letters to people that we would not send because it wouldn't be appropriate, or writing letters to people who are no longer alive, you know, just to acknowledge, you know, I did that. In um, traditional monastic Buddhist circles, certainly the Theravadan tradition, certainly, um, commonly there's a practice monthly where in the gathering, people stand up and they cop to their stuff, to put it in the hippie lingo from my youth. Uh, you know, they used another word than stuff. But anyway, just acknowledge it and to be so called admonishable, in other words, to, have, to be a person who would be willing to be open about, you know, breaking a rule or, you know, going to a place in your own mind that you really regret and want to acknowledge and admit, admit to others and maybe be forgiven. Anyway, that's a big deal. It's a really important part. So you might think about the kind of repairs that would bring you greater tranquility. If only privately inside yourself, like level one repair, kind of, uh, and then see if after you've kind of worked it through in your own mind, you're ready to really work it through with that other person, if that's appropriate, and you decide for yourself. You know, there's a proverb in the Buddhist tradition, goes like this, uh, there are those who do not believe that one day they will die, but those who know that one day they will die, settle their quarrels settle their quarrels. And in another memorable phrase, through repair, um, that, that's an aid to enjoying the bliss of blameless, blamelessness. And that bliss of blamelessness is very tranquilizing, isn't it? Okay, repair. To make a bit of a repair here, I just wanted to clarify something. When I was using the example of my client and antidepressants, I did not say that to speak against antidepressants. I was talking about processes that in that person's case were indeed numbing and blunting. Uh, that's the point. I'm talking about numbing and blunting. I'm not trying to pick on antidepressants. And as a clinical psychologist, I've seen them do wonders for people. Um, I've also seen them not work and have difficult side effects. Very individual. It's really helpful to work with people who know what they're doing there. So to be clear, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not critiquing antidepressants. So that's a bit of a repair. And if I didn't make that repair, I would be a little less tranquil knowing that I hadn't clarified that. And I appreciate the person who privately brought that to my attention. So repair, important. Second, another one, whew, like you may have experienced during the meditation, it's really helpful to know what tranquility feels like. Uh, progressive relaxation in the body, doing the body scan. You know, uh, John Kabat-Zinn, a great teacher, has taught, and 
mindfulness-based stress reaction. Other people have as well taught it, you know, scanning the body, deliberately relaxing, deliberately engaging the mindfulness of breathing practices that I borrowed from um, in two of the 16 total steps. So I pulled out two of those steps, tranquilizing the bodily formation and tranquilizing the mental formation as it's described, which basically means, you know, bringing a stillness and ease as best you can to your body, you know, as you breathe and as you remain mindful of breathing and then being increasingly mindful of um, the mind quieting, tranquilizing the mind. Uh, do it. Set aside a little bit of time, you know, where you let yourself really do that. Know what it feels like. That's the second major way to cultivate this factor of awakening, deliberate practice of tranquility quieting, easing, renouncing, you know. We chase after all these shiny objects in our awareness, in our consciousness, chasing this, you know, or we like freak out about that. Um, there's a kind of renunciation that can be really helpful, at least for a time where you say, you know, for this minute of tranquility, I'm renouncing the chase um, uh, of the shiny objects, Just releasing the search, releasing the seeking, the craving, letting it go, all right? So that's really good. Number two, practice, knowing what it feels like, tranquility. Another really good practice is to just be aware of that which is undisturbed, that which is steady, stable. Um, the stability of space. Right. So much of our suffering is because we're just, we're like that, ver that person who's running downhill and has to keep running to avoid falling down. <laughs> like that, right? And you know, when we start becoming aware increasingly of that which is not racing, we get more and more able to pull out of that kind of pell-mell habit. And so, you know, maybe that's just a kind of a sense of like, yeah, the stability of awareness. Um, the ground of ongoingness against which various figures pass, you know, like the sky, space, um, reality as reality. The content of reality is constantly changing, but reality as reality is continuously reality. And again, that all might sound abstract, but it's really useful to bring awareness. What about the stability can you feel a kind of stability of love? Um, yeah. Can you know that you are a stably loving person? Yeah. Okay. So let me take a quick peek at um, concept, comments coming in. Really good. Um, uh, tranquility, again, Holly's question at 57 minutes past the previous hour. Um, tranquility is, you just, there's, there's not, you know, there's like minimal reactivity, right? It's kind of like your room. It's a, it's a state of being. Equanimity is being undisturbed by all states of being. Uh, Equanimity, particularly as it opens out, um, becomes more and more informed by uh, insight into emptiness. And increasingly, you kind of get that, whoa, you're coexistent with reality unfolding altogether, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> Which somehow makes you start laughing. <laughs> That's a lot of equanimity. Okay, 
Well, I'll get to equanimity later. All right, let's just see here. All right. Um, yeah, that's, and there's so much about this that I want to draw on, you know, um, like at, uh, where are we here? Uh, iPhone at 53 minutes past the hour. Can you be very busy at work just because of the kind of work you do, but still be tranquil? Yes. Or being busy isn't equal to be being tranquil. Really good. So um, I've known people uh, or read about or heard them. I think right now, of, here we go, Joe Montana, San Francisco 49ers quarterback, who people would just describe him, you know, with complete chaos, 300 pound lineman rushing at him. You know, he's on his three yard line. There's like two and a half minutes to go in the Super Bowl or something like that. And inside all that, he's just cool as a cucumber. Uh, you know, sometimes people might talk about that as a flow state, but in other settings, like people who are excellent cooks, they're really moving quickly, or people who are really dropped into martial arts, um, there's a stillness in the midst of the activity. Uh, and yeah, I could say as a therapist that in, sometimes in certain sessions, there's a lot that's happening, but there's like a stillness in the middle of all that activity. Um, so yeah, I think we can absolutely find that stillness uh, or be aware of a stillness, a tranquility, even when things are happening um, around us. Okay, let's see here. Anything else? Yeah. Aha. Okay. Sue is asking a really interesting question at nine minutes past the hour. Uh, Dr. Hansen, really valuable discussion. Thank you. Question. How could, how should we be thinking of these capacities as they relate to each other? For instance, isn't mindfulness the first capacity we discussed, the first factor of awakening on the list of seven, essential for tranquility? Uh, we cannot be tranquil without being mindful, can we? And awareness, it is common to all these, isn't it? Great, great, great. Um, let's see, not to get overly complicated about it. Uh, tranquility is a state of being. We can be mindful of tranquility. To deliberately sustain tranquility and to deliberately nudge ourselves, as we did in the meditation, into a growing tranquility does require pardon me, hiccups, does involve a certain um, mindful awareness of your own process. And so, yeah, that's, that's really true. It's also true that as you develop trait tranquility, you know, so increasingly people recognize it in you, a kind of growing inner quiet, like an underlying peacefulness, on top of which there's good humor or momentary fieriness or something, but underneath it all, there's a underlying trait tranquility. Um, you know, as that is developed over time, it's a factor of mindfulness. It's a lot easier to sustain present moment awareness with a quality of recollectedness, you know, knowing that you're knowing, um, which is the heart of mindfulness. Mindfulness as mindfulness without adding other things to it, like curiosity or self-compassion. Um, it's a lot easier to be mindful in that way, steadily, as your mind gets increasingly quiet. Um, yeah. There's a sequence in meditation that has been really valuable for me uh, called, basically, it's a passage that's repeated in the Buddhist teachings to that we are to steady the mind internally, quiet it, bring it to singleness, and concentrate it. Concentrate it means tip into the jhanas, tip into non-ordinary states of absorption that can become revelatory. Um, but that's an interesting sequence, isn't it? Steady the mind internally, whatever internally means, but steady your mind, steadiness. So there's a stability of present moment awareness. 
of mindfulness. Stabilized mindfulness, steady. And in the steady, there's in, you're increasingly unagitated. You're steady, feel steady. And then quiet it. Not numb it, not suppress the mind, but quiet the mind. Open to quiet. Whoa, quiet. And then come to singleness. Singleness is uh, one of the five factors of jhanas, a kagata in Pali. Bring it to come to singleness. There's a sense of unification of, of who you are. Like steady, quiet. Mind as a whole, unified. And then tipping in if you do, into the jhanas or something, you know, that's, that's starting to access it. So anyway, my point there, in your own meditation, think of that sequence. Steady, quiet, coming together, increasingly a kind of a, not a typical kind of experience. More and more you feel like, whoa, not in Kansas anymore. And then you kind of, tip all the way out. So before we finish, I want to add a fourth and a fifth fac factor of tranquility, important thing, things. And so I think I've said, one, take care of outer circumstances, good. Two, repair. Three, train in tranquility, great. Four, really, really take care of your own needs. This overlaps with doing what you can with your external circumstances. But when your external circumstances are kind of, you know, mid-range, normal, kind of like what's it probably going to continue being, you can still accelerate your nurturance and meeting of your own deep needs because it's unmet needs or the sense of unmet needs, particularly safety, satisfaction, connection broadly, the sense of unmet needs that is understandably detranquilizing untranquil. So really, really, really <laughs> give to yourself as an aid to tranquility, which is an aid to awakening. You know, really think about, wow, are there unmet needs in myself that are understandably disturbing me because something's missing, something's wrong, which is a driver of craving. And craving and tranquility are um, they're not exactly opposites, but they they move in opposing directions, definitely. So meet your own needs. That's four. Really, really, like make a list. Mm. Do what you can. And then last, enjoy the tranquility. You know, as I was preparing for this talk, looking at traditional teachings about tranquility, one of the things that stood out for me was the repetitive emphasis on tranquility and gladness. And <clears throat> because tranquility is not very stimulating because it's tranquil, uh, it's really important to highlight uh, the reward value of it by enjoying it, you know, including can you enjoy a gradual quieting, a gradual tranquilizing of your own mind. Enjoy that which is tranquil. Enjoy becoming more tranquil. Enjoy, you know, oftentimes bodies are at rest, but the mind is agitated. You know, I know people who can do progressive relaxation, but then the mind really starts to run away, like a manic hamster on speed on the hamster wheel. Uh, so see if you can find ways to really appreciate how good it feels to be tranquil. Ah, <laughs> ah disengaged from the hurly-burly, right? Unjostled by everything around you, all the people bumping into you, like, ah, quiet in the midst of the, in the middle of the storm. Boy, does that really feel good, doesn't it? So how about we finish here? You know, opening into a last minute or so of tranquility together. 
Maybe even if you like looking at the faces on the screen, if you can see the faces, my face, and enjoying being a little calmer, a little quieter, or maybe a lot calmer and quieter together. And may tranquility spread throughout your body. May your heart be tranquil. Underneath any and all disturbances in your relationships, tranquility of open-heartedness, and lovingness that's innate in you. And may your mind be quiet as well, or quieter. May your mind find times of quiet. And may your growing tranquility be a factor in your awakening for your benefit and that of all beings. Thank you. You can follow the sound of the bell all the way out. 